on most of the major news channels, and he's published in nearly all of the financial publications. And you may recognize him from Mad Money as Kramer's go-to guy for the VIX. So he's basically everywhere, and we're glad to have him here today. So he's going to talk about predicting market moves using volatility and using volatility to spot the next big sell-off, uh, predicting short-term moves using volatility, and integrating volatility to improve long-term profits. So we're excited to see what you got for us, Mark. Behave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. So I'm throwing, I am gonna throw a little bit of a curveball. I'm gonna only present for about 15, 20 minutes, then we're gonna live trade for the rest of the time. Oh, and awesome. we're gonna, uh, go uh, dig in, find some real trades, go, go through and, and make you guys some money, which is why you're all here anyway. So, or, you know, if you want, I can do a 50 minute sales presentation or we can trade. What do you guys want? <laughs> <laughs> 500 down, down. Huh? Who's in? All right, let's have some fun guys. So um, the only thing I want to do is kind of present. So to start, I'm going to present a little bit, of, talk a little bit about myself because that's my favorite subject. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how we think and pick out trades and things like that. I can share my screen now, right? Uh, yeah, I can. All right. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit about my philosophy, um, and then we'll we'll spend the rest of the time. Uh, oh, I, that's not what I want. I want to. Oh, that was I want to present, not share. Um, so before we begin, just kind of basic disclosure, disclosures, and what it says is what I'm doing here is not, uh, is for education, it's not investment advice or tax advice or legal advice or anything like that. So if I do something and then you do it and you lose money, that is your fault, not mine. Uh, so there you have it. And today we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to show you what I think is a, an economic recovery trade that I'm looking at, and we're going to do some other trades here. But with the market down, last I looked, uh, spoos were down about 55. I, SPOOS is what we on the floor used to call the S&P 500. Why? The big contract symbol, all right? So most of you are familiar with the ES, which is the S&P 500 E-mini future. The big future that they tread on the floor, which is 250 times the value of the S&P 500, the symbol is SPZ. So we call it SPOOS. And, and so even as we were going electronic, we still called them SPOOS. So that is, um, you'll sometimes hear spoo, but generally it, uh, we use the term spoos. So I'm gonna talk about uh, how I see option trading. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit about my market outlook for the rest of, the, of 2020, and I'm gonna give you some, uh, some trades. We're gonna do spend some time trading. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Sebastian. Uh, I am the founder of optionpeak.com. I am also, a hedge fund manager. Um, I manage a, uh, a little firm called Carmeline Capital. Uh, this is not a promotion for that, um, you know, nor am I soliciting any business for that. But um, you know, if you're wondering what I do during the day, it is I manage money and I trade. Um, so I am a trader who likes to teach. I'm not a professional educator. What is, is kind of my story? Well, I was a market maker on the American Stock Exchange and the SIBO for about 10 years. Uh, the firm I started with, you know, I sleep, eat, and breathe the volatility index VIX. Um, there are probably about two or three other guys that can talk on the VIX level the same way I can. And the reason being is the firm that I got my, that I really learned how to trade under called Group One was the firm that launched VIX Options. So I was in the room where it happened, for all you Hamilton fans, as um, VIX, VIX Options were being launched and was a part of that whole process. Uh, I have been trading and evaluating VIX Options since there was nobody trading it. Um, I remember the day that Goldman Sachs came in and bought 10,000 calls and was the first big trade in that contract and have been trading it, analyzing it, making money off of it ever since. And so I sleep and eat and breathe VIX and volatility. And um, that is what I'm here to teach you about. And so let, let's talk. Um, why are you here? You want to make more money. You want to learn from the best. And you want to maximize your time. And I'm going to teach you 
how to quickly find trades and evaluate trades while we're going through this process. Um, and I'm gonna, you're gonna learn from the best, which is me. And I'm gonna teach you how to make more money trading options. So let's start with who makes money trading options. All right, and this is where we're gonna talk about volatility. What happens when an option trade takes place? There is a buyer and there is a seller. Somebody's making money, somebody is losing money, right? Who is making money? Options are a zero sum game, right? Isn't that right? All right, and this goes to my philosophy. Options are a zero sum game. Wrong, wrong. Options are not a zero sum game. Everybody loses but the market maker. Everybody loses but the market maker over time. It's like going to a casino. You keep going back. All right. You keep going back, you will lose. There are very few people that go to a casino and make money consistently. All right. Why? All right. Well, they went through um, Russell Rhodes, a good friend of mine, did a big study. All right. And he studied straddle prices. He studied option prices going into earnings for like six years across every stock in the S&P 500. Every stock in the S&P 500. All right. And what he was checking was did the buyer of options make money or did the seller of the options make money? And you, the answer was neither. Option buyers going into earnings lost. Option sellers going into earnings lost. Do you know how much they lost by? It wasn't a giant amount. There wasn't a giant amount. Do you know how much they lost by? The bid ask spread. That was it. It was the bid ask spread they lost by. So where does, what really determines that bid ask spread and what differentiates the market maker's ability to, to manage that bid ask spread? All right. And the answer is volatility. All right. Market makers are using volatility. Most traders are not. All right. And so the guys that go into, into Vegas are trading the same way the casinos trade. People that make money trading options trade the same way market makers trade. All right. Otherwise, you are setting yourself up for the percentage game loser. If you're not using volatility. All right. So let me kind of show you what I mean by that. This is the chart that most people use when they're trying to trade options. You know, I think Apple's going higher, I'm gonna buy calls. I think Apple's lower, I'm gonna buy puts. You know, I'm looking at, at a candlestick. Listen, there are people that do really well trading candles, all right? But when they use options, they're not, other than, their, than whatever advantage they are deriving from actual underlying price, all right? The options aren't helping them, all right? The options are providing leverage, they're not providing an edge, all right? They would do just as well or better trading the stock than options if this is all they're looking at, all right? So, and that's why guys that, that use things like candles, mostly stick to stocks and futures. They don't trade options. Why? Because options are frustrating to stock chart people. They're extremely frustrating to stock chart people. Why? Because they think they should be making all kinds of money and then it doesn't work out the way they expect. Why? Because they're looking at the wrong chart. They're looking at the wrong chart. This is the chart you're looking at. This is the chart I'm looking at. And what this chart is, is a, is a implied volatility chart 
for Apple Options that I pulled from Live Vault. All right, I'm looking at this chart first, then I go to the stock chart. And this is where I determine my trades. So I start, most people start, do they want to go long or short the stock? Then they go look at the options. What differentiates me and all the people we trade with almost unilaterally is I start, all right, I start with do I want to buy or sell options and then I go figure out what I want to do with the underlying, right? It's a totally new way of thinking for a lot of people in terms of how to view stocks and options, you know, stock options, totally different. So, you know, what does this allow me to do? All right, this lets me right, create winners because we, I used to create losers, all right? One of the things that was really unique for me in, in leaving the floor and coming to the retail world, it took me a while to figure out how to make money because I was so used to retail traders just sending me their losing trades. All right. Every time I saw a three lot, a five lot, or a, a 10 lot come at me to trade, I knew I was just booking money because uh, just stats in my favor. So when I left the floor, as I studied things and watched retail trader trade, I realized that they were not looking at volatility. And in my ability to manipulate volatility as a, as a floor market maker, I, knowing how I created losers, could start creating winners by turning the market maker's techniques of managing volatility against them. By going after volatility when it's too cheap and buying it and selling it back to the market makers when it's too expensive. Trading volatility as the first piece of my directional option trade. All right, so I'm gonna, I, we're gonna teach you how to create winners by understanding why most traders are losers. It's the exact same process. So let's talk about Coca-Cola. This was from a couple of weeks ago. All right, I'm gonna just walk you through one of the trades that, that popped up. So you're looking at a chart here. All right, and we're talking about the time frame right around in here. Actually, it's right here. All right, and if you're looking right here, you're, you're probably saying, well, I don't know what to do. All right, do I wanna buy a call, sell a put, buy a put, sell a call? What is my plan here? All right. And this is where us having not starting with the stock chart and starting with the volatility chart is so valuable. So this was the chart I was looking at. And so when I am, so when I'm looking here on this, chart right you can see we're here we're at a point where volatility is as low as it's been in months so here's my red implied volatility chart here's this chart and we're looking right in here all right now I'm looking right here and here. And so I'm saying to myself, okay, 
implied volatility is the lowest it's been in months. The lowest it's been in months. Not going to dig into realized volatility, but the stock has, has been moving around. All right. We're now up to kind of this level. This is where I made a stock opinion. All right. So I know I want to buy options here. This is the key. I started with, I want to buy options. Then I start here and I go, well, I think the stock is going to go higher, not lower. And this is me opining that it had held above all the moving averages I like to look at and was sitting and probably ready for some sort of push higher. And so really, really simple trade. All right. That's the wrong. Really simple trade, and this is the wrong slide, but really simple trade. We bought July 50 calls in KO for about 30 cents. We then sold them over the next three days at 50 cents and then 90 cents and then a dollar. In about four days, we made 139%. One, because we were right on direction. But more importantly, we were right on implied volatility because implied volatility, you can see, starts to actually go up as this thing is peaking out. So in directional trading, what I'm able to do is all right is i can be right half the time and wrong half the time and win all right now i'm right more often than i'm wrong right the, the but i could be wrong half the time and still win with the way that i'm trading why because if I'm correct on implied volatility 80 or 90% of the time, which I am, then my 50% winners are going to vastly outproduce my losers. Now, it just so happens that, you know, I do some other things and, and I'm a pretty good stock picker and I've got 20 years of, of looking at, at, at trades. So I'm able to pick out some, some pretty good stocks to go long and short. I'm wrong sometimes, but, and I'll go on losing streaks. But as it is, I, I'm usually right about 65, 70% of the time. And then I'm right on volatility about 8% of the time. So I produce a lot of winners. These are the last 18 trades that I put on. And they have been, sh the Apple trades that you see here, the only one of these Apple trades that was actually long was this guy. All right, short, short, short. And I've had some losers, you know, I lost on Zoom. I lost on another Apple trade where I went short because, you know, it looked like it was, it was coil, it was move, going to move lower and the implied volatility was too cheap. But I win a lot. And the reason being is I use implied volatility to my advantage. So my trades are entirely driven by volatility because I want control. I can't control the market, but I control my trading using volatility. All right, the value of volatility relative to a stock, all right, is that volatility can go anywhere, but comes back. Stocks can go anywhere and stay there. So I'm in a position 
where I'm able to take volatility and, and really hammer it home on some trades. All right. So let's walk through a couple of trades here. Wow, down 72 now. And we're going to do some, some actual live trades here. I've got to open up a couple of things. So what you're looking at, this is VXX. I, I have some, some VIX positions on. Um, and today is setting up for a day where we could be down a lot. A lot, but I love days like these because these are the days where I'm able to find trades that can work to my favor. A lot of trades can work to my favor. Why? Because we're able to kind of point out stuff that is moving around a lot more than we might expect or, or not as much as we might expect. So let's start with, the, with kind of talking about some of the ETFs. And some of the names that are, that are, I think, are pretty important for, for what's been happening. So XLE, XLI, XLI. These are all names that have done nothing. You know, we've talked about, everybody's talking about the triple Q's, right? And how great they've been. Right? The triple Q's are at an all, we're at an all time high yesterday in the middle of a pandemic. Spy? Not at an all-time high, by any level. But it's made a huge recovery. It's made a huge recovery. So here's a, a little bit of, uh, of, let's call it food for thought. All right, there are five stocks that roughly make up half of the S&P 500. Five stocks. Can you name the five stocks that make up half of, not the S&P 500, of the triple Qs? There are five stocks that make up half of the triple Qs. Can you name them? And we've got 35 minutes here, so we've got plenty of time to come up with some trades. Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, you're missing one. Yep, fine. Well, not Netflix. So, yeah, Google, the, so you have what I call the, what I, you know, you could say you've got Microsoft, Apple, the conjoined Google twins, the conjoined Google twins, and Amazon with Facebook. All right, and that is roughly, and I mean uh, roughly 50% of the triple Qs. So the NASDAQ 100 should really be called the NASDAQ 5. If I add in Intel and NVIDIA and Amgen and Biogen, I now am at about 65%. Can um, so you are talking with a index that really isn't an index. All right. But you know, folks, right. The S and P 500, right. That is 500 stocks, right. That's a diversified index, right? What percentage of the S and P 500 is made up of those five stocks? Microsoft, Apple, the conjoint Google twins, 
Amazon, and Facebook. They make up half. Yeah, it's about 22%, 23%. Believe it or not, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is a more diversified index with 30 companies in how it behaves than the S&P 500 is now. The S&P 500 is, five, is about 22, 23% those same five companies. So you have, the S&P 500 have been made that big recovery, right? It's down about 5% on the year now. Then we have the Dow. It's down about 10% on the year. But it still has Apple and Microsoft in it. Its biggest components are actually um, United Healthcare and um, United Healthcare and Apple. Might be Apple now. So then let's take a look at XLI. XLI is the industrial select sector. Who knows what is in XLI? I can tell you it doesn't have any of those technology names. The biggest holding is Union Pacific. XLE, uh, XOM is an XLE. So here we can go XLI components. And this is, by the way, when I do like chat discussions on a, a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday with my clients, this is kind of the discussions that we have where we dig into like really how to how to think and, and trade. But yeah, Union Pacific, Honeywell, Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed, Triple M, UPS, Caterpillar, General Electric, CSX, Illinois Tool Works, Illinois Tool. My friends in college used to call me that, the Illinois Tool. Uh, Northrop Grumman, Deere, North Norfolk Southern. All right. Those are all old line. You know, when we talk about the Main Street Index, right? Oh, you've got Wall Street and Main Street. I would argue that there is no better Main Street Index than XLI. Right? The other one you could look at is like XLE, Energy. There's another one. Main Street Index, Exxon Mobil, Text, uh, Chevron Texaco, um, Halliburton, all the all the energy names, Main Street, and then truthfully XLF. There's your there is your your bank, your Wall Street, and look at the returns on these names. XLF is nowhere near recovered. Nowhere near. Let's look at the returns on XLI. It's a little better, but it is not a lot better than XLF. It's down, let's see, the high was at 86, and it's down at 67. All right. It's still, and it started the year, I don't know, year to date. Yeah, it started the year to date 85. So it's off about 18 bucks. It's still down 20%. XLE, here's another absolute stinker, right? Before this whole mess, it was 60 bucks. It's now 37. It's off 23%. 
It's off $23. That's 30%. Who's heard that the, the recovery train has left the building? Who's heard that you missed your chance to get into stocks? All right, Who, who's, who's got that FOMO, that fear of missing out? Anybody here? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? I have that FOMO. Thank you, Edward. All right. So the good news is, and this goes to my 2020 outlook. All right. The best buys are not gone. All right. The easy money is gone. The easy, you know, blind squirrel finds a nut money is gone. But if you think buying Apple is going to be the trade that makes you the most money for the rest of 2020, you're miss, you are, are dead wrong. All right. The Apple trade. Now, there's some trades that I don't love, like Boeing. I think they've got problems for the rest of the year. I was wrong at the beginning of the year. At the beginning of the year, I made like, here's my best trade for the year. And I had a long Boeing trip. About one of the only real stinkers I put on. But I think Apple is, you know, let's compare the returns on Union Pacific, which is a great company. All right, versus Apple. All right, stuff needs to still get places. All right, let's look at the triple Qs. versus XLI. This is why I don't think we've got a major market crash coming. We might have a big correction in the NASDAQ, but that money needs to go someplace. All right, take a look at the return profiles here. Uh, in the last six months, since Christmas Eve, you've gotten a great return out of the triple Qs. You are down a lot of money in XLI. You're down 17% since Christmas Eve. You know what Santa brought you if you bought XLI? He bought you a Tupperware full of poo. Merry Christmas. All right, and, and let's talk about a, a one more name that I think is really interesting in particular. And this is what I'm gonna give you as what I think is my best recovery trade, Berkshire Hathaway, BRK.B, the B shares. So I wanna explain something to you. Berkshire Hathaway, do you guys, you, you know what they own? Who, know, who here knows? We all know Warren Buffett. Do we know what company Berkshire Hathaway, is, Berkshire Hathaway's backbone is? What's the backbone of Berkshire Hathaway? Sanjay is right. It is Geico, that little gecko. All right, Berkshire Hathaway is a reinsurer. They make all their money selling car insurance, taking the premiums and investing them, right? They own a huge amount of Coca-Cola and Apple. 
and they're sitting on about 50 billion in cash. 50 billion in cash. All right. What is the current market cap of Berkshire Hathaway at $178.22? Oh, whoops. And then we'll do something day tradery today. We'll do something that'll make money today. Whoops. They have more than 50 billion in cash. Yep. 50 billion in cash. And they own now. Oh, and the current market cap, if you look, of the company, about four hundred thirty billion bucks. This is the wrong. Oh, that's for the A share. You know, that's that's based on the A shares. So it's still worth a lot of money, but they're holding a lot of Apple, a lot of Coca-Cola. They own Burlington Northern. Did you guys know they owned a railroad? They own a lot of stock, right? Berkshire Hathaway Holdings. I actually do a quarterly I actually do a quarterly I call it Warren market um, and I I put together tra option trades in um, based on what they're holding in, in Berkshire Hathaway so not only are they holding a lot of um, Apple you know it's about you know, they own about $90 billion worth of Apple. So they have $90 billion in Apple, $140 billion with cash, and some of their private holdings aren't even on there. All right, their public holdings are worth about $225 billion bucks. MasterCard, Moody's, they own a whole, you know, you might say, yeah, you might actually say that Berkshire Hathaway is a better S&P 500 than the actual S&P 500 for kind of a measure of the overall market. They're a little soft in some transpo, but not that much. And they're a little soft in um in energy a little bit all right so with it here there are two ways that i like to trade so one of my absolute best trades of the year and it's starting to show up to, again was in the throes of this sell-off and, and this was not one I, I, you know, I, this is one we talked about in chat room, but I didn't put out as an official trade was in the throes of the sell off in March and April, I put out selling the June, 2020 160 put at about 20, 21, $22. And we, you know, I covered my shorts in here when it got to be around 14 bucks so on a two-year option i made seven dollars in a in premium sell why the implied volatility was really high and and it and i had a ton of vega in the tray so let me tell you what i like about berkshire hathaway in terms of trading it the implied volatility relative to its past 
is hot. All right, why? All right, well, the my big joke on is on the big issue here is Warren, right? Right, what what do you call it when so, when someone br it brings above market turns? They provide alpha, right? You guys ever heard that? Oh, he's bringing, he provides alpha, right? Oh, I want alpha. Beta is market exposure. Alpha is uh, above mar is exposure that exceeds or is better than the market. And very few people bring alpha. And Warren Buffett is one of the people believed to have alpha. So keeping it in our, our Greek alphabet, the one thing I'm worried about with Berkshire Hathaway is not Warren's alpha, but Warren's omega. Who gets that reference, right? I think I'm hilarious. Nobody seems to be laughing. So, <laughs> so, yes, omega is the end of life, get it? Alpha, I'm the, you know, alpha and omega, right? So, uh, yeah, I'm worried about his end. That said, how much managing is he really doing? He's doing some final writing off on things, but that's about it. So with volatility now back to where it is, relatively low, and if you look at long dated volatility, all right, it's got, it was much cheaper. This is, this is long dated option prices. So options with over a year to expire. Could certainly go lower. But now what I wanna show you is the next chart we're going to look at is movement. So each of these charts represent a different time period of movement. The light blue chart here represents movement over the last 20 days, about 37% annualized. The dark blue chart is movement over the last 60 days, about three months, right? Because this is trading days, not calendar days. And then this guy is movement over the last 360 trading days or the last 18 months. So let's look at the last 18 months relative to how much they charge you for the next, next year. What do you notice? Right, my implied volatility might seem a little expensive to the naked eye, but relative to actual movement, we've been moving a lot. All right, now we all know that we get big moves on the way down, but after we get that move on, what about the move up? Can we see some strong, fast moves up as volatility drops? Yes. Yes, we can. All right, so instead of buying the S&P 500, as a long play, because I'm still getting Apple in that, remember, I'm just taking out a little bit of the Google, which I think had, Google and Amazon have, and Facebook have, massive, massive regulatory risk. All right, Amazon in particular is going to get broken up in the next couple of years. Probably a good thing for the investor long-term. Near-term, it's a risk. 
So with Berkshire Hathaway, all right, as my kind of long term recovery trade. Oh, whoops, I've got to go. I always forget the nomenclature here. As my long term recovery trade, you can look at January 2022, which is 18 months to expire, or you can even go all the way out to June of 2022, two full years. And there is some money to be made 576 days. So as a, if you, unless you think we're going to hell in a handbasket for the next two full years, next 18 months, if you don't think there's going to be a, a cure for the coronavirus, this trade is not for you. But if you do, all right, now we're going to do, and here's the fun part, because I have not constructed this trade yet, we're going to do some strike selection. And, I'm, and so I'm going to go to skew. And I'm going to show you. So this is a graph of the implied volatility of every option in Berkshire Hathaway. over a quarter, going out 25%. And if you watch, I can actually see the strikes I wanna be trading relative to the stocks, the strikes I don't. Expand that out for you guys. not doing what I want. So you can see that there are definitely options I don't want to sell and definitely options that are cheaper than other options. So right now I'm looking at these 195 calls and I'm looking at the 205s, the 15s. So they seem to be a little off on the fives until they get to about 230. So the 230 calls seem to be the most expensive option on the book. And the 195 seem pretty cheap. So looking at that, just looking at that chart, all right, and I'm gonna look at it one more way because I want the real time chart. That's the late 15 minutes. Here's another look at that. Stop me if you think if I'm if you're if you're bored. I'm trying to teach you guys some stuff, so you can actually see now what where the the edge is. If I want to go long, I absolutely want to use these 195 calls, and it looks like yeah, I want to sell the 230s. And so I'm getting a 35 point call spread. For about 10 bucks, that's a really good risk reward. Now I could stretch it out a little bit. I could, I could move some things around. You know, there's definitely some, some opportunities floating around.
all right? Depending on, on how I want the risk reward to line up, but this is a trade that, you know, I, as a long-term trade, like. All right, now if I wanna go really long-term, I can look at June of 2022. And I'd wanna sell the 35s and yeah, buy the, looks like the 195s again. 195s are kind of the cheapest option across the board. A little more expensive. So I'm doing the 195s because the uh, 235, because those are the cheapest options on the board. So if you look, I'll explain this one more time. You can actually see, you could argue that the 215s are the cheapest option on the board, but those are a little far out of the money for me. Um, you can actually see where there's like, you know, some mispricing on these fives. And you've got an opportunity to take advantage of it. The 190s look cheap too, frankly. And so we're not selling vol, but what we are doing, and here's one that's 40 bucks wide and it's gonna cost me about $12.70. And if I just look at the risk profile, that's got great risk reward. And I'm really just relying on this getting to, and this is one of the things when I set these trades up, when I set up a directional trade, I want it to have been there in the recent past. And Berkshire was above 190 on the 10th of June, two weeks ago, today. Two Tuesdays ago, Berkshire Hathaway opened 195 bucks. You know how much this spread was worth then? More than it is now. I should show you. The 20. The 190s were $25, the 230s were about eight bucks. So this spread was $17, it's 1270 now. You think I can make some money on that? What do you think? All right, so now, what about for the rest of the day? How are you gonna make money on today? Well, we're down $95, we're down 3%. The only name that is not getting absolutely face punched is Apple. Did you say face punched? I said face punched. I like throat punch, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mark, we could watch you all day with live trading, but we have another guest coming up. All so right, all right. You promised a really nice offer for our people that are coming. I, I do. So um, if you want to learn volatility, then you need to understand the VIX and VIX futures and VIX options. And remember, that's kind of what I sleep, eat, and breathe. So I don't want anything. What I want to do is give you a VIX class. It's a 50 minute VIX class where I walk through how VIX works, VIX options, VIX futures, VIX ETPs. You're gonna spend 55 minutes, give me, you know, you're gonna give me a little bit of information, I'll send you. So you're gonna get this class and then I'm, I send out a letter every night walking through how I see VIX that goes out to, to subscribers, gives you my traffic light on what I'm seeing in VIX and you're gonna get that and it's all free. So zero cost to you. For Mark, and we'll still see you, Mark, but we won't see your screen. We're going to put the uh, offer slide up there so they'll have the link. And yep. That I think is in our slide number nine. We should be good to go. There you go, guys. So 
um, you know, I want to say thanks to everybody. Um, on the day, if you're looking to if you're looking to make money, I think that shorting Apple for the rest of the day makes some sense. Um, the implied volatility is relatively inexpensive, so I'm going to be setting up a uh, some sort of long put play, okay? probably a put spread or a put butter play. I will probably be doing that when we get offline now. So <laughs> there you go. Hard for me to stop myself sometimes. I know. <laughs> Hard for me to stop you. You are our favorite VIX expert and um, really enjoyed. We've done some live events with Mark up at the <laughs> CBOE. We've had mm -hmm. a blast. He is just the ultimate when it comes to training. So hopefully people will take you up on this offer. We've got the link. If you get any questions, our support team is here. They can share that link with you later. Mm -hmm. But I think probably unless we have any issues, let's get on to the prize time. Is it